Listener Production. Hi, Sasha Barbagat with you for The Briefing. Did you know Australia has been recruited by America to produce some of its weapons? The wars in Ukraine and Gaza have stretched US capabilities to make things like artillery shells and missiles. So it's taking advantage of our munitions factories that have room to grow. The idea was that Australia would start producing these both for themselves, potentially for export, but also, and this is, I think, critical, to help backfill US orders, which are kind of spent way down. So where have weapons made here ended up? And deeper than that, what are the implications globally when countries rely on buying and selling devices that are designed to kill people? That discussion gets underway in the second half of today's episode. Before that, though, let's get into the biggest news stories of the day with Benzion Siebert. It's Monday, the 25th of March. Good morning, Sasha. Flags across Russia have been lowered to half-mast as the nation marks a day of mourning following Friday's deadly concert hall attack in Moscow. 137 people have been confirmed dead, and that number is expected to rise after four armed men opened fire on concert goers at Crocus City Hall. A further 154 people have been injured. Flags at the US, UK and Netherlands embassies have also been lowered in respect for the victims. ISIS-K, the Afghan arm of ISIS, has claimed responsibility for the attack, releasing graphic body cam video of the shooters hunting down victims. It's the deadliest attack in Russia since the 2004 Beslan school siege. Despite the group claiming it had carried out the shooting, Russia's president has tried to blame Ukraine for the massacre, saying they caught the gunman trying to flee with help from contacts in the country. They tried to hide and were moving in the direction of Ukraine. According to preliminary data, they had a crossing of the border prepared from the Ukrainian side. That was Vladimir Putin speaking there. Ukraine's president, Volodymyr Zelensky, had this to say in response. Putin was silent for the whole day, thinking about how to link it to Ukraine. Everything is completely predictable. Now, Kyiv has completely denied any links to the attack and has indicated it believes Moscow is preparing a pretext to escalate the conflict. And I have seen the word re-energise thrown around Bencion in relation to Russia in the wake of this devastating attack in Moscow. Mm. 11 people have been arrested, including the four gunmen, according to Vladimir Putin. As we heard, Russia has also claimed the gunmen were caught trying to escape across the Ukrainian border, but Ukraine's described that idea as absurd since it is actually an active front line full of Russian soldiers and security services. In related news, though, Poland has demanded an explanation from Russia over a missile it says was in its airspace for about 30 seconds over the weekend. Poland is, of course, a member of NATO, so if a missile actually exploded on its territory, that could require the rest of Europe to come to Poland's defence, which all of which kind of shows how potentially volatile the whole situation is. The Tasmanian election happened over the weekend and it kind of raised more questions than it answered. On Saturday night, the Liberals, Labor and the Greens all gave a victory speech of sorts, none conceding defeat. But then yesterday the picture became clearer with Labor leader Rebecca White admitting her party had no path to forming minority government. It's very unlikely that Labor can form government. And on the basis that the Liberal Party have won more seats and convention would dictate that the Governor would ask the Premier uh, to form government, whether it's in the Parliament or um, with the support of the crossbench. Uh, That is the likely outcome of this election result. Rebecca White speaking there. That means Premier Jeremy Rockliffe will return to the role but will need to form a minority government. The Liberals need 18 votes in the lower house to govern but it will finish with between 14 and 16, meaning that they likely need the help of the Jackie Lambie network and the independents. We'll be doing a full breakdown of the results and what they mean in this afternoon's episode of The Briefing. And the public is being told to give the Princess of Wales and her family time to heal in the wake of her cancer diagnosis. In a video released by Kensington Palace over the weekend, Kate announced she had started preventative chemotherapy following major abdominal surgery in January. This, of course, came as a huge shock. 
And William and I have been doing everything we can to process and manage this privately for the sake of our young family. Now, this comes after weeks of intense speculation about her health. The internet went into meltdown with increasingly bizarre conspiracy theories, from rumours about a divorce from Prince William to claims she had died. A former spokesperson for the pair, Paddy Harvison, has defended Kensington Palace's handling of the whole saga. They're a family. They're just really a bit like you and I. Lots of families have dealt with this. And what do families need when they're facing cancer is time. Time to come to terms with it individually as a couple, and then with their children. Bention, you know, I've seen a lot of... We talked about this on the briefing. We've done social media videos about it. And I did see a few creators who had kind of made Kate Gate their entire personality over the last few weeks, kind of feeling really bad about it and saying they have regrets, essentially, that they went so hard on something uh, and it turned out to be a really serious health issue. Yeah, and obviously in retrospect, all that speculation, particularly the more bizarre and wild versions of what might have happened to Kate, sound really crass and awful. I would, though, say, you know, this is not a family like you and I. This is a royal family with a lot of staff, a lot of people who are paid to get this exact kind of thing really right, and they got it really wrong. I would argue that there was no need for them to send out a photoshopped photograph pretending as if everything was okay with Kate. I think that after months of speculation, um, they should have come out much earlier. All that said, of course, you know, If someone gets cancer, this is a real family, real people. Um, We can't really judge them for that. I just think the PR on it was awful. Mm, And I do think there is a different... The the public seems to have a different expectation of Kate and Will's. I think with Philip and the Queen, it was very, very private. They never spoke about any health battles. When King Charles came out and said, I've been diagnosed with cancer... There was a level of shock to that because we have never been given that sort of access. Even though it was, you know, fairly uh, muted in its information, it did confirm that he was having a health battle with cancer. I do think, though, that the public expects more from Kate and Wills, maybe because they're younger, maybe because they present as more relaxed, trying to be like, hey, we're the monarchy, but we're chill monarchy. Uh, And people did want more. And you're right, I think the PR was completely ham-fisted. But yeah, obviously, you're right. She deserves privacy and she deserves time to go through that with her family. Bencion, thanks so much for joining us for the headlines today. Next up, it's our deep dive into where Australian-made weapons are ending up around the world. Since the war in Ukraine, it's become clearer how much the world relies on the making, buying and selling of weapons. Here in Australia, it's been a goal to make it onto the top 10 of global defence exports, though we are yet to reach that target. In 2020, the then Morrison government actually boasted about the fact there isn't a single F-35 fighter jet production operation that doesn't feature Australian-made components, while a deal is underway to have American missiles and artillery shells made right here at munitions factories in Victoria's high country. So where exactly have weapons made here ended up? And does that make us responsible for the deaths and misery of people these devices are used against? Charles Edel is a senior advisor and Australia chair at the Centre for Strategic and International Studies, and he joins me now. Charles, tell us about this new deal which will see Australia make weapons for America. It's been an ambition of the Australian government for a while to increase its own production of uh, munitions. This grows out of, I think, multiple defense strategic reviews highlighted most recently in the defense strategic review of just last year, uh, noting that due to the increasingly hostile threat environment that Australia faces, it needs to have the ability to produce more weapons, have more capabilities for deterrence, and if all else fails, for war fighting. Uh, This is where an initiative that was launched several years ago, uh, GUIO, it's a horrible acronym, but the Guided Weapons and Explosive Ordnance Program uh, that Canberra has stood up, has taken off. But this past January, uh, we saw the first big announcement here that there was going to be a plan for co-production. Lockheed Martin uh, was going to be producing 
a type of munition called Gimlers that go into high Mars. They're the missile that are shoot out of kind of mobile trucks. These were made famous uh, in Ukraine uh, because they were so effective for the Ukrainians to use to kind of scoot and shoot, as they said, and hide as well from incomings. And so the idea was that Australia would start uh, producing these both for themselves, potentially for export, but also, and this is, I think, critical, to help backfill U.S. orders, which are kind of spent way down uh, at this point because of what's happening in Ukraine, because of what's happening in the Middle East, because of elsewhere. It's not exactly a state secret that the United States and others don't have nearly enough, have not put their defense industries in full mobilization while both the Chinese and Russians have. And so the idea is, can the United States and others begin to plus up what they have for deterrence purposes? Look, how long has Australia been making and supplying weapons to other countries? I mean, it's not that people don't know about it, but I think it might surprise people by how rampant it is. Well, uh, rampant uh, is, I think, in the eye of the beholder, but Australia's been doing this for a while, and it's not only weapons, it's weapons systems, it's some of the maintenance. I mean, I don't think it would surprise many Australians, or shouldn't, that uh, Australia manufactures offshore patrol boats and gives them to the Pacific Islands, gives them to Papua New Guinea, gives them to Micronesia, uh, gives them to the Solomon Islands in order to help patrol their own waters. That's a type of defense equipment. There are different types, obviously, of defense equipments, but Australia produces and exports some of these. What's more interesting, though, uh, to my mind, is that when we think about the balance of what countries' defense needs are, Australia is consistently one of the largest importer of weapon systems because its defense industry is rather small. It's actually one of the five largest defense importers in the world, but it does have uh, unique capabilities. Uh, we talked about the offshore patrol vessels. Uh, we can talk about several types of uh, anti-submarine missiles uh, that it produces. We can talk about the Bushmasters, which I'm sure many Australians are quite familiar with, uh, 120 of which have gone to Ukraine. So it's a combination of both what Australia produces and then what it needs to import for its own defence needs. Mm. Is there data available to show in terms of exports from Australia where we are exporting these weapons and capabilities to? Yes, but with a large caveat uh, is I think the answer. Because of a number of factors, uh, some of which is the complexity of kind of licensing versus kind of full uh, servicing uh, versus self-reporting on companies, there's not full transparency on the Australian system. Uh, That is, we don't know exactly in terms of exports what the number is, how large it is, and necessarily what goes where. Although, again, uh, that doesn't mean that there's no transparency here. I would refer you and uh, your listeners to sites like the Cipri website, which is very good year to year. I mean, you can see exactly how many Bushmasters Australia has sold to Ukraine. You can see uh, what else it's put to Timor-Leste and other countries. So again, there is data. It's just not perfectly transparent. So the two examples you gave there with Ukraine and Timor-Leste, you know, those are in uh, missions that are perceived as, I suppose, good by the Australian public in that we want to help Ukraine fight Russia, we want to help Timor-Leste keep the peace. Do we know about other areas that Australian weapons are ending up in? For example, in the Middle East, are they being used in the fight in Gaza? You know, what about Saudi Arabia? Do we know whether that's happening? Uh, I'm not sure there's full transparency uh, on all that. I do know that there are export licenses, a fair number of them, uh, that went to Israel for self-defense of purposes of Israel uh, as well. But again, uh, because we know that there's not full transparency, no, we can't answer that with any type of assurance about who the end users are. Is that concerning? Uh, Well, I'm not an Australian and I'm not an Australian taxpayer. Uh, If I were an Australian taxpayer, I'd probably want to know where these exports end up at. Because I suppose the question that has come up a fair few times since the war in Gaza really escalated towards the end of last year is this argument that countries that supply Israel weapons are somehow complicit in the murder of people in Gaza. Now, that's not necessarily what we're here to answer today, but I suppose it is a question for people in their own country to say, well, are the weapons we're making ending up on those battlefields? And is that right? And should we pull that support? What are the geopolitical impacts of that? First of all, I would note that for the export of military weapons, look, they fall into at least two different types of categories, which I think you noted in your question. 
uh, both those that are used for defensive purposes and those that have more offensive uh, reach and category. In practice, there's not always a bright shining line or distinction between those two, but many of the exports that go to Israel, I'm not talking necessarily from Australia, but are used for the self-defensive purposes of the IDF, of the Israeli Defense Forces. Uh, if you think about the countries that they are surrounded by, if you think about the attacks that they are launched on, uh, have launched on, they import a lot of materials too. In terms of uh, the concerns of what the end users, look, Australia, like every other country, has the ability to regulate end user requirements, that is for self-defensive purposes or other, right? And other being more offensively minded. So again, that's perfectly within the rights of a country to regulate that. Many countries do do that as well. How important is the supply and, you know, import of weapons on a global scale? Like, does it make the world go round? Is it something that we need and is necessary? Whether we need it and is necessary are different parts of the question. It's a large industry. It's not nearly the largest industry in the world, but it is a lot of money that we're talking about. We're talking, I think, the publicly available data said that in 2021, that's the last time we had figures available, we're talking about $121 billion, that's U.S. Uh, figures, worldwide arms exports. That's a lot. One of the things that we have to think about uh, here, or at least that I try to think about when I'm kind of crunching through these is, does that look large? Yes. Has the arms trade been around for at least the last five, six, seven, eight hundred years? Yes, as well. And countries need equipment for their own defense and occasionally uh, for other needs as well. And so when countries think about how it is that they are going to acquire what they describe as uh, what they need for their military and for their security, countries have a choice to make, right? They can either kind of make sure that they produce everything on their own, comma, there is no country in the world that has made that decision, or they kind of go into bespoke areas themselves, or they just import all their things. So this is a large part of the global arms trade. Uh, the other thing that I note, though, that I think is an important element of this conversation, Sasha, is that, you know, these lines are never static, how much countries spend on their own defense requirements. Uh, there are a number of reasons, obviously, while countries will decide to either cut spending or increase spending. Again, I'm going to majorly overly simplify here, but probably the number one reason uh, that countries decide to spike or increase their defense budgets is their own country's recognition of deteriorating security environments around themselves. So over the last couple of years, globally, but yes, in the Middle East, yes, in Europe, and also especially in the Indo-Pacific region, because of spikes in military modernization, uh, we've seen multiple countries increasing their spending. And I would note that in Australia's strategic documents laid out in the Defense Strategic Review and elsewhere, uh, this government has said that this is the worst geopolitical environment that they've seen in the last 70 plus years. They generally uh, don't call it by name, but when they talk about kind of unfettered military modernization, we're talking about the rampant growth of China's military complex and the increasingly assertive use that it's put to. So again, if we kind of wrap all those things together, when countries look at that, when they look at the more aggressive ways that's been used by the Chinese, but also by the Russians, it's a natural, if unfortunate, but natural response of states to want to increase their own defensive capabilities. Is that something we can expect to continue seeing then over the coming years? Is Australia only going to increase its production of weapons and, and military capabilities? Maybe. Uh, I mean, I, I think the answer is probably yes, Sasha. But, uh, you know, I think that there are a couple of factors that go into the calculations of any given government. The first and foremost is what do they read their geopolitical and then the more regional threat environment to be. If everyone around you is arming and if things are looking more aggressive, it would be folly to stop buying weapons yourselves that you can hopefully deter acts of aggression upon. So it does matter about what the geopolitical circumstances look like. My read on this is that we are not heading into a more benign uh, environment. So I think that factor suggests that we're likely to see an increase. The second factor is, of course, how much money the government has to spend on such things. In democratic nations, defense capabilities are one need, but they're only one need of several. So it depends on how the economy is looking, uh, what kind of revenues are being brought in. But I would say that those two factors 
what the geopolitical threat environment is and how much money the government has to spend give us indicators of what we see. And because the geopolitical threat environment is looking so dire at this moment, I think we should expect multiple countries to increase, including Australia, uh, their defense spending. Charles Adel, thank you so much for your time. It's a chat that I think is worth having and is interesting for people to know. They might not realize kind of what is going on with our defense capabilities. So we appreciate your time. Yeah, thanks for having me on, Sasha. That's all for now, but we'll be back this Salvo at three with another deep dive. And if you liked this episode, we'd love if you could share it with someone you know. I'm Sasha Barbagat. Thanks for listening. Listener.